Hello and welcome along to the latest Liverpool Echo Blood Red podcast. If you celebrated, we hope you had a very good Christmas. We'll be talking about a late Christmas present for Liverpool fans. News, of course, breaking that Cody Gakpo has signed. He signed last night. We'll start with him, Doyle. Obviously, Liverpool adding to their forward line. We'll talk a a little bit about the the rest of of January and plenty of other things throughout the podcast. But uh, first and foremost, what were your initial thoughts when that news broke? Apart from you were already very tired after Aston Villa and you'd rather it didn't happen that particular night. Yeah, that, that wasn't very helpful, I'll be honest. And also it happened just after Jurgen Klopp had finished his press conference, so had it come out about 20 minutes earlier, we'd have been able to ask him about it, but he'd, uh, he'd gone by that point. I think before we go any further on this podcast, I think we should point out it's the ill podcast because I'm not particularly great. Seeing Joe coughing away there, and I know, Matt, you don't sound 100%, so this is the, you know, we're cracking on in this Christmas week for our listeners, that's what we're doing. Putting our bodies on the line physically and mentally over this difficult, hectic, festive period. And going back to the yeah, the transfer, yeah. So on the Monday, yeah, obviously that's when we discovered it. It kind of came out of the blue, didn't it, in a way, because Liverpool weren't really realistically linked. Although I would like to point out that uh, we did do a podcast last week and we did discuss transfers. And I said, look, if Liverpool are going to sign anybody, it needs to be a forward, without having any knowledge of this happening, by the way. I said that Liverpool need to sign a forward, and it? Ian Klopp spoke today and said they'd made a decision two or three months ago for, for sporting reasons to, to get somebody in, whether it was going to be January or at the end of the season. He kind of later admitted that the injuries to Diaz and, and Jota, while not massively influencing the fact that they were actually signing in Gakpo, they did, it did help that he was then you know kind of available in the January, which meant that they could bring him in and kind of alleviate some of the some of the you know the pressure on the remaining fit forwards. So I mean from from a profile point of view, you look at it and you think he's 23. It's kind of the same age that I can't remember how Diaz was. He wasn't 23, was he? I think he was slightly a little bit older. But you look at Jota was 23. Um, and you know, Salah wasn't much older. Manny possibly a little tiny, a little bit older. But these are, are players who, as Klopp said, when they've come to Liverpool, they've taken the next step. And all of them have done. Some of them even more so than others. And he said that you're looking at at a Gakpo, the player that sorry that the times that he's had to step up, he's done so. And I think while you never buy anyone on the back of a good World Cup, I think the fact that he played so well and contributed goals for a Holland team that, as Klopp said, wasn't particularly set up to suit a striker because they had nearly everybody behind the ball and didn't really create any chances to get to the quarterfinals. He was a, a large part of that, certainly scoring every group game. And I think that kind of twisted their arm a little bit more that, that they could get something done now because he's in such good form. And I think that's something that Liverpool will need. They, they, they can't really afford someone who's going to take months to settle because you've seen it so with Diaz last year and Jota the season before that is that when somebody comes in straight away and it's the ground running, they can make a big impact. I think that's what Liverpool need due to the shortage of options on that left side of, uh, of the attack, which is where he's going to play. You look at his numbers. I uh, can't remember this off the top of my head. I'm sure I've worked this out. I think he's played 31 games for both club and country this season. I think he scored 18 goals and contributed about 19 assists. So it's quite a lot of, maybe probably not that that many, but it's a lot of goal involvements. And that's what Liverpool's forwards are all about. Look at Salah's numbers, look at Jota, look at Nunes. I know we're going to speak about him a bit later on and what, what he brings to the team. But he brings numbers and that's what Liverpool need from their forwards. So in that sense, Klopp did say that now's the right time to move for him because if he goes to Spain... Scores 40 goals in a season there. Liverpool, be, his actual word was unaffordable. Wouldn't be able to afford him. So Liverpool have had to do what they've done with Diaz to a certain degree. Get him in before he went anywhere else and saw his value rocket higher because they believe in the potential of the player and they'd rather he carried on realising it at Liverpool than than anywhere else. I think the, the value thing, Joe, is is interesting. There's been sort of lots of talk really around sort of it being, what is it, an initial 37, possibly rising a, a little bit above 40 in, in all. It it doesn't seem like that big a fee when you think of, like Doyle says, the number of goals, the number of assists that he's got this season. You only have to compare it, say, to Anthony going to, to Manchester United for around double that in the summer. It, it does seem like Liverpool have managed to find some good value with this one. Yeah, it seems to be a lot of people quite shocked that they got him for what feels like, I always think it sounds a bit weird when you say that 37 million, so it feels like a small fee, but, but like like you say, with the point now, Anthony, it, it does feel like a, a, a smaller fee for a player whose profile, certainly in the last six months, has ridden, risen considerably. And I think probably that's 
well, I'm not probably. That's certainly part of the reason why Liverpool have gone for him now, because they probably feel that that fee could rise even more in the next six months. <clears throat> And there could be more interested parties. And I always think with Liverpool, they have to operate, you know, they're not like Man City, are they? They can't buy Erling Haaland, the finished article, like the wages that he brings and, and the transfer fee that he brings. You know, they they have to sign the Nunes of this world, the Cody Gakpo's players who have great potential and um, are coming in at a time when they're on an upper trajectory. But it, but they don't, you know, we, we don't know for sure whether he's going he's gonna to work out. But, you know, They've got a good track record. They they tend to work out in the past, and you know it's going to be very exciting to see whether he Diaz and, and, and Nunes as well as Jota can form the future of Liverpool's front line. And um, you know it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because as Doyle said, it came totally out by surprise. I think most people were thinking we're well, Liverpool by a midfielder in January. Um, you know, I've seen a few people complaining this isn't what they need, but I always find that slightly odd because you know a good recruit is a good recruit. I don't think you necessarily need to. You know, but buying him forward doesn't mean you can't buy a midfielder and, and vice versa. So, you know, I, I think Liverpool still know full well they need a midfielder and they need more players in that part of the pitch. But it wouldn't surprise me if they go out and buy those players in the summer and that they, they knew that they knew they weren't attainable now, so they thought they'd strike while this this forward is available. So, I'm really really excited by him. One thing that really gets me, and it's the same with Nunes, is he's quite tall, isn't he? he seems to be quite a quick, tall player. Um, physically able and, and I know Liverpool seem to like that sort of profile of a player so that should be handy and yeah I'm I'm, I'm excited to see him play so um, you know it won't be um, won't be Brentford will it Doyle Clock was saying that today but it looks like Wolves in the FA Cup I always find it slightly odd that they have the, the transfer window opens on the 1st of Jan but everyone that sort of does the paperwork's off so that the players actually can't play until quite a bit further away why don't they just open it on the 2nd of January so that players can play straight away and those people can process the paperwork it seems a bit silly but yeah anyway looking forward to um to seeing him play and it's going to be really interesting how, how liverpool make up that forward line when everyone's fifth but um you know it might be a little while before that is that, that happens yeah it might be a, a good few weeks possibly a little bit longer before liverpool have that sort of headache but it, it is interesting to, to sort of think about where he is going to fit in don't he? obviously liverpool have lots of players who've played off the left we watched him obviously during the world cup playing through the middle i think he, he described himself when he was asked by uh, liverpool's media team yesterday as a false nine and, and someone who wanted to, to play in that role i suppose part of, of the reason they will have bought him is that he can play in a number of these roles it, it doesn't have to be the case that he can just come in and, and play one but how do you kind of see him fitting into this Liverpool attack well he's going to play on the left when he comes in simple as that because they haven't got any left wingers basically well, immediately but in, in yeah, yeah, yeah. well, it just it's like we don't really need to know that do we I think the, the, the point is that where do you see Nunes for example I know we're going to touch on him in a bit but you'd see him down the middle wouldn't you and you see Salah down the right and then suddenly you've got three players for the left wing but you know they're all going to get games because Jota can play down the middle and possibly sometimes down the right and and you know obviously the new lad can play in all the positions as well he can play in that false nine if, he, if he's if he's come out and said that you know then he's obviously feels, feels quite confident he can play in that position because you'd argue that there's only really Firmino that can do that for Liverpool at the moment so I do think that uh 17 goals and 18 assists by the way in the in the 31 games uh, I just checked when, when when Joe was talking so I not really that fussed about where he plays I mean, it's like, where, where does Diaz play? As we said, he plays on the left, but when he plays, he's going to be playing. Where does Jota play? You know, where did Mane play? He played on the left. Uh, he started on the right, then went to the left, ended his Liverpool career playing down the middle. So, you know, Salad normally plays down the right, sometimes play down the middle. It's the fact that they can all do this and interchange. I don't think we should be worrying too much about where he's going to play. It's just the fact that he's available and he's he, he's an option and he can play in all these positions. But, you know, you, you're right. There will be one position in the end where he'll probably think, I want to go playing there. Funny though that Klopp, Klopp said it's on the left wing and then he said that he can play as a false nine. So, you know, already um, a bit more versatile than perhaps the manager thinks. 
yeah, I'm sure that can only sort of add to the appeal. The, the false nine thing was was interesting to me, Joe, as well, because we heard Jurgen Klopp say today that he was absolutely insistent that he wants Roberto Firmino to, to sign a new contract. I mean, it, it might not be in the summer that Firmino moves on, but it did strike me as being interesting that Cody Gakpo says he can play as a false nine. Roberto Firmino coming towards the end of his contract. As I say, it might not be this summer, but at some point you think possibly that could be a, a bit of a succession plan in, in that way as well. Exactly, and that's why it's good business, isn't it? Because Liverpool are replacing those players while they're still there. And, and you know, they, they sort of did that with Diaz and Mane last year. Um, and it just feels like it's a gradual transition. Um, but I think Gakpo seems to cover Liverpool on a number of bases, doesn't he? You know, in the in the short term, because they've got those injuries to Jota and, and Diaz, um, potentially in the long term with a, a totally new forward line, uh, once sort of Firmino, Salah, those, those old guard move on. And maybe in the medium term as well, if, if Firmino does either leave in the summer or, or sign a, a contract extension, but then doesn't feature as, as prominently as he has done. So it makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, it saves Liverpool potentially spending more money further down the line when, when as and when Firmino does leave. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I still think Firmino might be one of those people that he gets towards the summer and then he signs a, a shorter contract extension, like the way you see with Henderson and Milner. Um, seem to do because um, he does seem settled there but then at the same time if he's on big money and he gets a, a lucrative offer from I don't know whether it's the, the Middle East or perhaps back in Brazil um, that would probably suit him as well so be interesting to see what happens with Firmino Klopp clearly wants him to stay so um, hopefully they can make that happen because I think he's still got his use for Liverpool yet and it would be good if the likes of Gakpo if he's going to play in the false nine position gets a bit more time playing alongside Firmino to learn off someone who does it very, very well. Yeah, certainly good to, to have those options, isn't it? I think even if Roberto Firmino was to move on, it'd be quite nice to see Liverpool keep the uh, the six attacking forwards or certainly the six senior options that they've got in that area of the pitch. That would certainly be a, a useful thing. But uh, Dodie Klopp was also asked about the rest of January, what sort of that looks like. Obviously, as we've mentioned, not just a, a forward that Liverpool were looking a little bit light, obviously light in, in midfield as well. Are you any more convinced that they might do something along those lines or what do you make of, of what Jurgen Klopp said today? I think I'm convinced they're not going to do anything. I think they've got nine midfielders, is it? If you go through them, you've got Fabinho Henderson, Thiago, Elliot, Jones, Dr. Chamberlain, Cater. Bash Ketic now, you could argue, is an option. Arthur Mello, although he's obviously injured for a long time. Cavalio can play there. Firmino's played there. What we're up to now, 11. Um, so there's, there's there's quite a lot of options, especially if they're going to play the three. Milner, there's 12. So there's a lot there that they can pick from. And I think they're quite aware that I think three, that four of those players I just mentioned are out of contract at the end of the season. They're not all going to stay. Probably most of them won't. There's a likelihood that none of them will. So they're going to have to replace them at some point and they'd rather as joe kind of said that they've signed the player now because they they could and they need him in gakpo and they're gonna you know keep the powder dry for the summer and, and get in the couple of midfielders that they need in which they obviously hope that one of them is a is somebody who played for england the world cup and plays for Borussia dortmund then originally played for for birmingham city and he's had his shirt re retired there and he's also interesting uh, Real Madrid and manchester city so don't want to mention his name but uh yeah it's uh, it's that player so I do think that, yeah, I would be very surprised if Liverpool signed anybody of real, in terms of transfer value. There's no, I mean, they may end up signing like a, a youngster, like they did with, you know, Cavalier, they did something like that. Um, you could do something like that because they're always looking, but unless something happens whereby the opportunity is there and it's somebody they were going to sign in the summer, a bit like Gakpo. I can't see them signing anybody else in January. I suppose the the one thing that you would say about the the attacking signing, Joe, is that it will mean that maybe one or two midfielder options could come into it who don't then have to play on the left hand side. You think of of Oxley Chamberlain, maybe that could free him up a little bit. Fabio Cavallo as well can can play there. I mean. It is clutching at straws a little bit for, for all of these players to stay fit, but as Dodie says, there are there are some options for Liverpool in that area. There are some options. I mean, I mean, the main thing I would argue is that these players don't have a track record of staying fit, do they? So, you know, but perhaps Klopp knows that. You know, we know what Liverpool are like, and, and as he's just as Donny's just alluded to, I think you know that they do have targets in mind. But 
I'd be very surprised if those targets were, were available in January. So, you know, they, they get a muddle through um, until the summer for midfield. So, like, you're right, you know, I think Oxide chamberlain he drifted out the game, didn't he, significantly, I thought, in the second half on, on Monday night um, from the left-hand side. But in the first half, did all right there. Um, but in midfield, especially at home against different types of teams, I think he, he could be an option. And then hopefully... And we've been here before, haven't we? But hopefully, Cater can stay fit. Um, they obviously have Elliot now, and and and, um, and Henderson, Thiago, and, and Fabinho are all currently touch wood still fit. So they have options there um, as we speak. But we know that that can change with Liverpool quite quickly. So I don't want to sit sit here and be accused of jinxing it because um, you know it's, it's not it's not very often that Klopp has said in press conferences this season, um, like he just has that there's no new injuries and they've actually just got another player back. So. Um, long may that continue. Yeah, Stefan Bersetic as well, one of those doily yeah. that's that stepped up a, a little bit and, and done done very well in the, the, the couple of games that he's played in the moment. Took the goal certainly very well. Do you think he could have a, a big role to, to play in the second half of, of the season or would you expect it to be kind of a, a five minute off the bench kind of thing as it was against Villa? I think it'll be more than five minutes, but he's not going to play a big role now. He's 17, 18, sorry now. So yeah. I can't. <clears throat> you know, we went through all of those options as 11, not ahead of him, but instead of him that can play. So I don't think that uh, he'll be getting too many minutes in it, you know, when push comes to shove. But that's not the point. No one's expecting it to be. He's kind of a bonus. He's the bonus player this season, isn't he? To come on and, and do that against Aston Villa. He's, he's played well whenever he's came on. I think there was one. I think City, City started against City, didn't he? And I think that was a bit of an education for him. So, but what do you expect? Still a teenager playing against Manchester City, you were quite good. So, you know, he's not everything after that's going to be a lot a bit easier. So, from that sense, he's played. He came on against Ajax, didn't he, in the Champions League away from home. He's played in a, a big atmosphere there. Although, admittedly, it wasn't much of an atmosphere by the time he came on because uh, Liverpool were winning three 0 I think. But still there. And um, yeah, I don't think we should put any kind of like great pressure on him. There are a lot of professionals who've been in the game. Out, for a lot of years ahead of him, he should be taking on responsibility. He shouldn't be given any responsibility. He should just be given the opportunity, like Ben Doak was uh, from the bench. Uh, Aston Villa came on, did Luca Dean, and then just uh, ran down the wing like he does. Anyone who's watched him at the academy just did exactly the same thing. And uh, blame him no pressure. So don't think Bush Kettis should be considered a serious option this season. But if he carries on the way he's going, he will be definitely be a, a bigger option in the years to come, because what we, you know, at, look at Tyler Morton for example. This time last year, Tyler Morton had been was playing in the first team for Liverpool, and now he's, he's spending an entire season at Blackburn, the team who don't never draw, um, just playing playing there. And he's playing every single week in a, a kind of not defensive midfield role, but it is more of a, a, a you know a deeper line midfield role. That's where Bash has been playing. So Liverpool suddenly have two younger options in the same position. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes uh, longer term. Yeah, certainly be interesting. Have to uh, learn how to say his name properly as well. I think between us, we've said it about four different ways so far. I thought it was. Good. I thought it was. What are you saying? I think it's Bajketic. I said Bajsetic, but I don't, I don't think that's right. Um, I haven't attempted to say it. I just always sidestep it and just say Stefan. Stefan, the teenager, Spanish Serbian. Yeah, yeah, Spanish Serbian. The the twenty twenty yeah. signing. You know, just keep saying different ways, but definitely don't say his name um, until. Yeah. I, until I certainly have to. If he plays a couple of years for Liverpool in the first team, then I'll be forced into learning his name. It could be ba- it could be Baketic or Baketic, shouldn't it? I can't. You know, it could be. Perhaps we should speak to him and ask him. Really, should we? How do you pronounce your name? Come on, tell us. And then he'll say it, and we'll forget. Like yeah. Pep, who's the assistant manager, Matt? Pep, Pep Blinders, which of course no one calls it, even though that's yes. how you pronounce it. Even oh, yeah. Why do you call him Pep Blinders? I'm pretty sure Klopp calls him Pep Blinders. Because. <laughs> because I, I spoke spoke to someone who he worked with at Porto about two years ago, and he said to me that that's how it is. And apparently, I uh, I looked it up as well afterwards, and apparently, in Dutch, that is how it's pronounced. It's Pepine Linders, apparently. It's like Dirk, Dirk Kout. He was never should have never been pronounced Dirk Kout. It was Dirk Kout. But people did ask him how to say his name, and he, mm. he refused to explain it, didn't he? So hopefully, yeah. Stefan by his Yeah, yeah. By... The, the ultimate yeah. example of this one is, is Jan Molby. It's not even pronounced like that. It's Jan Molbu. That's how you're supposed to pronounce it. But he just gave up on that about thirty odd years ago. Uh, 
well, hopefully Stefan Bysetic manages to uh, explain it to us at some point <laughs> over the next few weeks or months as he becomes a, a more important part of this Liverpool team. But we'll uh, we'll move properly on to, to Aston Villa, Dodi. I'll come back to you on, on Darwin Nunez. There was a couple of, of different bits that we wanted to, to get into on this, but he's kind of the, uh, the obvious talking point. I don't want to use the word chaos to describe him because I feel like I've said that so many times this season, but... It is hard to, to think of, of a better word to, 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 to describe his performances. I, I will take you to half time in the press box, press room, sorry, Aston Villa. And there was a discussion between a number of journalists in which the virtues or otherwise of Darwin Nunes were, were debated. And it was decided that he was not of the lesser type of footballer. Uh, and it was also agreed, basically, that he's just a bit weird. When it comes to football and i think you know not weird as a person but just it's like the way that he's playing football at the moment he's this kind of player that you mentioned chaos just whenever he gets the ball you don't know what's going to happen he's like a little bit not like a rigi but the difference <laughs> with the rigi is that i always thought he never knew what he was about to do i think nunez knows what he wants to do um but he's got so many as, as joe mentioned before that the that, that post got the attributes you know, he's very tall he's very strong he's very fast that He's getting into positions we saw against City. He had three chances against Villa. He had certainly, we, again, we had a debate of is it a chance where that one that drops down, you know, the mistake clearance and it drops down and he tries to volley it first time? Is that a chance or not? You think he should have touched it? I thought he was offside, to be fair. If he'd have took a touch, then it would be a chance, but he took it then, too soon, didn't he? he? And he I, took I, the I shin, thought. didn't he? I thought it was hard luck, actually. I thought that I thought was, it was hard, hard luck. luck. Yeah, thought... the set, one in the second half, he could have done, he should have done a lot better with that one. I think that's the one time it was kind of betrayed that he, he'd he had the kind of incidents before. But against City, he set well, up a goal. Well, he tried with his, with yeah. his left. Yeah. Yeah, against yeah, City, he sets up a goal. Against yeah. Villar, he sets up a goal. So he's still contributing these numbers. I think before the World Cup, he'd scored, someone said, seven in ten, was it? So it's like, he's a striker. You know, he's going to miss chances. He'd be more worried, if, as Klopp said, he'd be more worried if he wasn't there getting these chances. But obviously, there'll come a time where he has to score them. But uh, no, he is... Uh, I mean, every time I write about him, people get really angry because I I'll, I'll like so I don't automatically say, oh, he's the greatest player ever. But he's not. But he might end up being really, really good eventually. Look at, you know, I'm going to make the comparison with a former, your, uh, former Liverpool player who played for Uruguay, Luis Suarez. When he first started, everybody realised he was dead good at football. But for the first 12, 18 months, he didn't score loads of goals. And then suddenly, whatever it was, clicked and then he was away. And then literally he was away after that because he left. So um, I think that for Nunes, he's in the right team to create chance, to get chances because that's the way Liverpool play. And anyone who saw him play against Liverpool last season knows that he knows how to finish. So that's there in him already. It's just a matter of like with any striker, sometimes it's just not there and it's, you know, it's just not there in the moment. And he'll, he'll probably score either a ridiculously good goal in the next game or like something that's dead spawny. And then he'll be off then. He, he does just generate those chances though, doesn't he, Joey? He, he does feel like one to me that, I know we've kind of said it up to, to this point in the season, he's been at, at Liverpool for, for a good number of games now, but it does feel like at some point he will just have that moment where one goes in and he maybe goes on a bit of a run, like like already said, and, and what Klopp said, if, if he wasn't getting those chances, you'd be worried, but the fact that he is, it, it's, it's kind of not really a, a big issue at this moment. Let me tell you a story about a player called Emil Heskey, who used to always get in the right positions to score goals. And there we go. There we go. Premier League goals, that's a fact. Not many players have done that. So there you go. He's in the 100 club. And, and Darwin Nunes, same thing, gets in the right positions, doesn't he? But in all seriousness, the only thing I think is, I think about the Suarez thing, and it, it, it feels like the easy comparison, doesn't it, Suarez? But I don't remember the discourse around him at the time when he scored, say, 11, was it 11 goals in his first full season? Being about him being wasteful, it was more um, you know, people you say he's a scorer of great goals rather than a great goal scorer, or he's a more deep lying forward than, than an out and out goal scorer. Whereas Nunez isn't a deep lying forward in any respect, you know, he, he he sort of operates pretty much everywhere, doesn't he? Nunez, but um, and he does miss he does miss chances. I got a text on Monday night uh, from somebody saying, I, I'm done with this dosser after he missed what the third of of of, of several big chances and I, I you know I couldn't have I couldn't have disagreed with that more but at the same time it what it wasn't it was hard not to get frustrated with him when he when he did miss 
that chance on his left foot that Doyle mentioned, you know, because as I say, the, the volley was, you know, I, I thought he, he did quite well to take that early and I thought he might catch the goalkeeper off, off guard and, and put it in. He didn't, but the, the other one, that one on his left foot, he thought, oh, come on, you've got to get that on target. And it, it seems to happen to him a, a fair bit that he misses chances. But I do remember another player um, who I think it's forgotten about because he turned the corner pretty quickly and ended up having a, a magnificent season. But if you think back to Salah's early few months at Liverpool, he certainly missed a lot of chances. And I remember particularly in the, in the Man City 5-1 game, or 5-0, sorry, I should say, um, where Mane got sent off. Before Mane went, in the first, it felt like half an hour of the game, I'm pretty sure Salah had two or three big chances to score and, and didn't. Um, and then he just suddenly got into his groove. And and that's the hope, I think, for, for, for uh, Nunes, is that one or two more start going in, he gets a bit of luck. Um, because he can't keep getting into these positions and not scoring goals. And he's already scored a fair few this season. So the biggest worry for me is that the discourse around him gets stronger and stronger and you st- see more of these compilation videos. And while on one hand, it's easy to dismiss them as silly social media nonsense. I also think it, there is a danger that that gets into the player's head and he worries about himself and, you know, starts snatching at more chances and it, it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle. So hopefully he can, you know, put a few away. And I think, I hope, the, the clock plays him a fair bit through this next period to try and get him on the score sheet a fair bit. I suppose that the thing for me, though, is he scored, what, five in the Premier League and, and three in the Champions League so far. Eight goals at, at this point in the season. It, it feels later in the season than what it is. Even if he carries on scoring at the rate that he's scoring at this moment, you'd think he'd end up with, what, 20 for, for the season? 20 goals a season. I know Mohamed Salah will probably get more, but that's not a bad starting point to be coming off from. No, it's not. And he'll probably get that if he doesn't, if he avoids injury because of what we said, because they're going to create that many chances. And uh, I don't know sure what, what more we can say about him now. I think we've, we've, we've kind of de- debated him there. I mean, he'll, as I said, he could easily just score a ridiculous overhead kick against Leicester on Friday night or hit a shot that it's both posts come out, it's the goalkeeper and goes out for a, for a throw in or something stupid like that. You know, that's the kind of player he is. He's just there. Uh, he is, he is not funny to watch, but he's someone who's always going to generate debate purely because of the way that he is. But I do think that, I think anybody who's having a laugh at him now, I do think that over the course of time, Nunes will have the last laugh. Yes. Has he had a quiet game for Liverpool yet? I'm trying to think uh, back. Any game that he's played in, could you call it a quiet game? I can't think of one. I can't think of any. When he came on against Derby, he had a couple of chances, didn't he, in the League Cup at the end? He's got, a pen. Feels, he's got a pen as well, didn't he, in the shootout? So, yeah. It feels like every game he's been in, he's he's either... Well, he, he certainly attracts attention, doesn't he? And, and, and I just can't... I can't think that that is a bad thing. I can't think that's a bad thing for him to be involved in so many... Because even if he doesn't score, there's opportunities for others to score, isn't there? So, you know, I, I'm I'm still very excited by him. And, I, you know, whenever his name is on the team, she's... Um, He's box office, isn't he, Joe? He's box office. He is. He is it's a cliche, but he is box office. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, hopefully the same with Gakpo. But when you, when you sign players, you know, it's like Salah. You almost take Salah for granted now. And Salah is more cerebral about the way he plays. You know, when he first started, he was involved in everything. And now he just pops up in the right positions and scores his goals, doesn't he? And, and, and whereas Nunes is the one that you're watching all the time and, and, and keeps you entertained. So, you know, whenever he's on the team sheet, I'm pretty excited about watching Liverpool. Yeah, I'm sure he'll continue to get chances as well with Trent and Robertson putting crosses in. Doidy, we'll come to to those two next. Obviously, Robertson with uh, a breaking of a, a record. I'm sure Trent will will overtake him at some point in the the Premier League. And the pass from Trent as well, which uh, generated that first goal. We've got to talk about that. It was uh, it was a really promising sign, wasn't it, to see both of the fullbacks doing the things that we've kind of got used to them doing up to this season. But Robertson was like that before. Before the uh, before the World Cup, I think it was after the last the last international. He didn't start the season particularly well, but after the international break that was before the World Cup, which would have been end of September, beginning of October. So the following six weeks after that, I thought he was really good. Uh, with Trent, again, even Trent started to find a bit of form, didn't he? Just before they went off to the World Cup, which is partly why there wasn't the big hoo ha over him being selected. Of course, although he, didn't have, he only played what half an hour against Wales or something like that. Um, 
But yeah, with it, 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 talking about the goal, the pass, is that when the ball dropped to him, I spoke to a ghosty about this a bit a bit later on, you just thought, well, something's going to happen here. You, know, you didn't think, what's he going to do here? Because you, know, you, you always expect him to do something. And it was all over in a split second. He spots the run, which is great in itself to actually see it and envision it. But then to then have the actual skill to then hit it with the outside of his foot and put it right there where it kind of invites invites uh, Robertson just to put it across goal and Salah knocks it in. So I think second half, he got a little bit tired, I thought, because we were, we were kind of, Liverpool were defending the end. That that wing was by where the press box is at Villa Park. So we got to see quite a lot of him. And um, who came on? I can't remember who came on, or who was playing at left wing for Villa. But he never got past him once. But it, there was a, quite a few times where it wasn't much last ditch, but... Trent had to put in a bit of a, a bit of a sprint, a bit of an effort to get back and, and stop it. And I think that told a little bit in the last last like uh, twenty minutes, which is why Joe Gomez came on. But overall, for Trent to you know play that pass, the overall game did well. Always looks a threat, and he was putting in a, a, a few good crosses as well. I think that uh, it all all goes well. And as I said, I think Robertson was just carried on where he where he left off from uh, from back in November. I think the the thing with the the pass, Joe, from Trent and, and a couple of other bits in there is you could just see there was a little bit more confidence within him, as as Dory said. We kind of saw that a little bit towards the the back end of of the first part of the season, but he did just look like things started to come a little bit more naturally to him again, which obviously can only be a good thing. Yeah, that's it. He looked a bit fresher, didn't he? And like you say, like things were coming naturally. I think it is the best way of describing it because he does look like a a player who in the past several months has overthought things a little bit you know he, he clearly has got great ability but I think at times has just overthought the defensive side of things and not just allowed himself to play so you know I think almost the World Cup did him good because after the whole debate about him playing for England or not that all settled down because once the World Cup started it was caught, sort of accepted Trent's not really going to play here and he was just out the spotlight then so you know it probably would have been worse for him if he played at the World Cup. And then if they'd have conceded a goal, there might have been a load of debate around his positioning or whatever it might be. So, it you know, I think he does look a little bit refreshed. Um, and Liverpool themselves, I think, as well, you know, looked refreshed and that will help him. You know, I think they did give up chances to Aston Villa the other night, but it was a much better Liverpool performance all round. And I think Liverpool would much be much happy to be in a game like that where they do give up a few chances but create far more at the other end than, say, against Nottingham Forest earlier this year, which was just a, a slog. So I think I think Liverpool look better in Trent for it. Um, so hopefully this is the start of a, a bit of a, a better run of form for him and the team. But um, yeah, I think think the World Cup probably on the, on the slide did him a bit of good. Yeah, I think it could be that sort of open game against Leicester as well. Just before we finish, we can pick our teams for that match, Doyle. Obviously, we know Cody Gakpo won't be playing. Alison Becker will be. And do you want to talk us through your back four? Yeah, I think it will be uh, Trent, Van Dijk, Canati and Robertson. Interesting. Connor, stay straight back in. Joe, same for you or, or Matt to stay in? See, that's another one, Connerty. I know, yeah, I, I was going to mention that there. Yeah. Yeah. Connerty, <laughs> Connerty, is it like Connolly, yeah. Connerty? Yeah, yeah. Conate, Conate, yeah. let's, let's decide on Conate, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Conerte or Conate is, is not coming straight back into mind, just because we haven't seen too much amount. Yeah, I, I would keep it the same, I don't see the point in, in messing around with it, so same back four for me. Yeah, same for me, same for me, Joe. We'll move on to the uh, the midfield as well. Same midfield as well, Joe, or are you going to make one or two changes in there? No, I, th I think I think in midfield is where you're going to have to rotate a little bit because they've got another game, haven't they, Monday? And then obviously that old dusty cup the following weekend where you could probably just put the under 12s out, couldn't you? Um, now they're out the league. How, how devastated were you back? <laughs> Had they lost in the league cup? <laughs> it was absolutely devastated. But the, again... Look at how good that game was, by the way. Not enough has been written and said about that that brilliant game of football, better than any game that we've seen in the last six weeks. Um, just, it is the best. Honestly, FIFA's, the best thing FIFA could do is just scrap their club world championship plans, scrap the World Cup, and just buy the rights to the League Cup, call it the FIFA League Cup, and that can be their thing, can't it? Um, so, there you go. That's my... that. 
Infantino, if you're listening, I'm feeling a bit league cuppish today, and you could, um, you could get in touch <laughs> he with me. He always could, listens to the podcast. Could, yeah, he does. Yeah. Uh, do you know? He feel he feels a bit a bit blood red today. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if you are feeling blood red today and you are listening, Infantino, give us a call. We could um, <laughs> sit round in a Salt Bay restaurant and discuss um, the future <laughs> of the, the league. Cup. Can we get him on the pod? Get yeah, him on Salt right, Bay, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, it'd be good to see him at the League Cup final, wouldn't it? Sprinkling salt all over the, the trophy. Um, I've, I've lost my train of thought. Um, what was it? Midfield. The midfield. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to mix it up a little bit, um, just because I think they've got they've got many games. They're gonna have to rotate there. So you know what? He's fit. We may as well use him. Get Nabby back in there. He can um, he can put a shift in. We haven't seen much of him, so I'll throw him in there and I'll um, I'll take out I'll take out Thiago. Um, yeah, and, and, and put in so it'd be Henderson, Cater, and Fabinho. I'm going to go the uh, the same as the other day, Donny. I thought Fabinho was was good as well. Looked a, a little bit sharper and a, a little bit more like his usual self against Villa than possibly what he had done in the start of the season. Are you sticking with the same, or are you the same as Joe making a change? Depends on what Henderson how he feels. Henderson because he's not been well, has he? So uh, I mean, Fabinho's definitely playing. And Thiago. So probably, yeah, I would probably not play Henderson and I'd play ooh, Harvest, Harvey Elliott, play him. Yeah, there are a, a few options, aren't there? Front line then. Donny, I'll come back to you. I think I can guess two of them and then possibly the, the third one as well, but I'll let you talk us through it. Yeah, Darwin Nunes can go on the right, Mohamed Salah on the left, and we're going to put uh, Adrian down the middle. No, <laughs> okay. that would be silly. Uh, although, that would be, I'll tell you what that would be. That would be weird. Um, <laughs> Nunes down the middle, Salah on the right. Keep it the same. Uh, Ox can go on the left. I thought he, while Joe's right, he did fade second half. I did think he did well first half. And it was his run where he just kept on running through all the players that won the uh, corner from which they scored the second goal. Yeah, I think, think he did all right, didn't he? I think I'd probably put him in again, probably see Fabio Cavallio off the bench. Same for you, Joe, or are you going to mix it up a little bit? Mm, yeah, I was... I was... Before you asked the question, I was thinking of saying Cavallo just for the sake of changing it up. But you know what? You've charmed me. Let's um let's let's leave Oxlade Chamberlain in there. I think he deserves another go at it and um it'll do him some good as well to get a bit more game time under his belt. So yeah, um we'll stick him in there. Yeah, it'd be nice to see him given a, a little bit of a run, though I doubt that will last for too long when a couple of those options come back. But hopefully he can make the uh, the most of that. We'll finish with uh, some match predictions then. I think I'll go 2-0. I think Liverpool might keep a clean sheet. I think they'll uh, make make light work of, of Leicester. I'm sure Leicester will want to bounce back from their result against Newcastle Doyley, but Liverpool to win? Um, you'd think that they would do. I mean, Leicester, I've seen them play quite a bit uh, this season and they're not very good. Um, so you compared to what they used to be like, that and they've got no Madison there. Does Vardy even start anymore? Did, didn't he come on a sub against Newcastle? I've not yeah. seen the game obviously because it was at the Villa game, but yeah. But Vardy always scores against Liverpool, so I'll go three one Liverpool. Vardy will score for Leicester. Yeah, he, he didn't play did he the other day, but I'm sure he probably will do. And Anfield, Joe, what do you reckon? I fancy a three one, um, just precisely because yeah, I think Leicester sort of. Sort of team to have a decent goal scoring record against Liverpool but yeah they just think of a side that is treading water until the manager leaves really Leicester um, you know they've just they've been nothing this season haven't they really so uh, yeah um, 3-1 feels about right you, you chipping Brendan then? I just I just feel like I just feel like you can tell that this cycle at Leicester has come to an end and, and I think He's a bit of a cyclical manager, isn't he, Brendan Rodgers? I think his 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 methods work for a little bit and then sort of wear off, and that's what it feels with Leicester. It feels like in terms of transfer spend as well, he's taken them as far as he can. I, you know, I, I just think it's a matter of time before he leaves or gets the sack, and and then you know they start again with someone else. Um, so yeah, yeah, no. I'm, I'm have to agree with you. I'm not sure where he would go next or, or who Leicester would get, but yeah, it does sort of feel like uh, another defeat probably wouldn't do him particularly good, but we shall see what happens. We'll leave it there for today's podcast. We'll have the next Blood Red podcast for you on Tuesday. I'll be after both the Leicester and the Brentford fixtures. Obviously, they were all playing Friday and Monday this weekend. Loads of other content on the channel, the Echo site and Liverpool.com as well before then. Have a happy new year and we'll catch you next week.